good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Faculty of Public Affairs Research Award Symposium. And as we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are guests here on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. My name is Andre Plod, and I'm Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs. In 2018, the faculty recognized the outstanding research of Laura McDonald with the FPA Research Excellence Award. And then we sent her to work. We sent her to work to organize the symposium that you are part of today. So it's very nice of us, don't you think? We kind of say, you're doing a great job, and on top of that, we're going to give you more work. So thank you for undertaking this. <laughs> so the award, of course, is, is an invitation to the, to, the, to the recipient to host the symposium during FPA Research Month. And that is, therefore, what brings us together today. Today's symposium is entitled, Trading on New Terms, Civil Society, and North American Free Trade. It's occurring at an important time in North American relations. National governments have changed in all three countries. The trade agreement linking all of our three countries has changed, and the role of civil society has changed as well. We especially welcome today's speakers who will offer insights into the shifts on the North American landscape from many perspectives. You're also welcome to attend the other events happening during FPA Research Month. Over the next month, we're hosting public lectures, symposia, and panel discussions. Most of them actually happen right here. And in particular, we have our graduate conference next Monday and Tuesday with discussions on topics that are quite related to what you're going to talk about today, including the international economic order and US tariffs, supply management in Canada. Everybody is invited. Please register through the Faculty of Public Affairs website at uh, carlton.ca backslash FPA. Thank you again for coming, and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Hi, everyone. I am indeed the uh, lucky uh, winner of the research award for 2018. And uh, so I'm Laura McDonald uh, from uh, Department of Political Science and Institute of Political Economy. I'm going to speak more formally later, but I just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, it is some work putting this together, but I'll, I have many helpers. Um, and um, I feel extraordinarily fortunate to be able to listen to the speakers today who will uh, teach me a lot, all of us a lot, about these exciting, important events that are going on around us. So I just thought it would be interesting and fun to kick off the day with a little video um, that uh, I found on the internet that was produced by the AFL-CIO, the American Federation of Labor, help me, labor people? Congress. <laughs> Congre Congress. Yes, OK, the main uh, labor feder federation in the United States that uh, they produced um, uh, during the discussions of the renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement. So to give you a, kind of a sense of the tone of um, responses to those negotiations um, coming from at least one sector of civil society. So there we go. You can ride down the street and see these big plants that once employed thousands just sitting there idle. It's devastating to know at one point you could have worked, raised a family, got into the middle class, and now that possibility is no longer there. I know there's talk today of renegotiating NAFTA. If trade deals are good for Americans, why aren't Americans allowed to see what's in these trade deals as they're being negotiated? Been here all my life. I'm a third generation steel worker. My dad was a union guy. Yep, UAW. Our life in Lorraine back then was pretty good. It was very good. Being a kid in Lorraine was great. He was always playing basketball, having 40 yard dash races up and down 20th Street. A lot of people was working. And there were thriving businesses all along 28th Street. In some fashion or another, everybody remotely worked for U.S. Steel and, and wanted them to do the best, or Ford and wanted them to do the best. I think they call us the Rust Belt now. In the late 90s, 
some of the larger corporations started to leave our area, one of which was Ford Motor Company. When U.S. Steel closed down, that hurt a lot of people. When jobs disappear in Lorraine or other communities like Lorraine, it, it just has a, a devastating impact in the quality of life. Loss of revenue seems to disproportionately impact people of color. You start losing public service personnel like firemen, teachers, policemen. A lot of foreclosures, a lot of empty houses. It's been trying. We've got to make sure that people understand that the economy that we're in today is a bigger problem as a result of what bad trade deals do in communities. The trade deals of the past really have been written from the perspective of corporations. When workers' voices are not present in these deals, if they're not good labor standards or environmental protections, a whole host of people are actually losing out our workers in this country got a bad deal, but so did those workers in Mexico or in Canada. How do we get back to good? The labor movement has leaned in on trade deals in the past. TPP was no exception. Labor has to come together in any new renegotiation of the North America Free Trade Agreement and bring with it um, all of the sectors. My hope within this town is really coming together with jobs coming in, well-paying jobs that you can support your family with. You'll find no harder worker than in the state of Ohio. All we ask for is a level playing field. I hope that the younger generation is able to take this situation we're in and mold it into something that we can all be proud of in the years to come. We in the movement have to continue to fight, and I think labor is stronger when it stands united and stands together. That's what we did to defeat TPP, and that's what it's going to take to get a good renegotiated trade agreement. Okay, so thanks. So um, I just thought that video quite effectively raises some of the issues we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, the response of workers in particular to the effects of uh, the restructuring of the North American economy. Uh, you might take issue with some aspects of the analysis, but I think it, it raises, you know, it sends a very powerful message about uh, what has been the nature of trade deals up till now the sense that uh, ordinary people were not included in those discussions, civil society were not included. Um, and uh, interestingly, at the end, um, when you think it's gonna be kind of a Trumpist, um, you know, America first, we uh, it's all Mexico's fault kind of message, um, uh, the union representative says, well, it's not just us, it's not just the Americans who are suffering, Mexicans and Canadians also uh, had problems with these trade deals. Um, and that indeed is uh, what I'm gonna be talking about later is about uh, transnational linkages amongst civil society groups in uh, the three countries. But before that, we uh, uh, have the privilege of listening to a series of speakers who are going to introduce the situation in the, each of the three countries. So I'm going to ask Chris Gabriel to come up who's gonna be chairing the session and our three session, uh, speakers and she'll introduce them for us. My name is uh, Chris Gabriel. I'm Associate Dean in the Faculty of Public Affairs and Associate Professor of Political Science here at Carleton. Um, it's my pleasure to chair the first panel of this event, Understanding the Current Political Context. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers uh, in turn and uh, they are each eminent in their own fields and you can read more about them in the bios that you received uh, in the package. So without further ado, um, our first speaker will be Chris Sands, uh, who is at John Hopkins University, followed by Julio Durazo Herman at the Université de Quebec at Montréal. And uh, our last speaker will be Meredith uh, Lilly, uh, who is uh, here. Uh, at Carleton University. So they'll each speak in turn for roughly uh, 20 minutes. I'm firm on the time, I've warned them, uh, to give us some time for uh, questions and answers and discussion uh, to follow. So uh, without further ado, I will ask 
Chris Sands uh, to take it away. Um, thank you very much, Christina. Um, it, it's always an honor to be back at Carleton. And when I say back at Carleton, uh, I'm an American who spent my junior year abroad, or you'd say third year, uh, in the political science department here at Carleton, and then had the chance to come back when I was working on my dissertation on a Fulbright uh, at the Norman Patterson School. Um, so I, I feel like I'm coming home, except the building's completely different. So it's like going back to visit your parents, but they've downsized and they're living in a condo and it's much nicer really but no memories um, anyway so I'm glad to be here thank you very much for having me what I'm gonna try to do is talk a little bit about the US picture on civil society and put in context what I think the USMCA provides in terms of opportunity um, for civil society have uh, a say in how the USMCA using the American acronym sorry about that um, uh, take shape I'll talk first about process and then about what people are doing and, and, uh, and I'll keep to 20 minutes so not to get in trouble. So we've seen for a long time uh, with civil society uh, a process which some of the political science community refers to as hitchhiking. They have a cause, uh, an issue that they want to put on the political agenda. And those of you who've read your uh, John Kingdon about agenda setting and windows of opportunity that pop up. Um, it's very much in that vein. They look for something that has politicians' attention and then try to find a way to attach their issue to that thing which has more momentum to move forward in order to get progress on the issue that matters. One of the classic examples that some of you will remember, um, because it's very American, is uh, trying to declare HIV AIDS a national security threat because it meant that the Pentagon budget might somehow have something to do with research and, and advancing that cause. We've seen that done for a number of, of social issues, whether it's integration of African Americans into the workforce or women in the workforce and, and now people of different sexual orientations. So um, the Pentagon's obviously a big target, at least in the US, it's a very big budget. And so if you can find a way to get Congress to attach your cause, then you, have, uh, you get attention, you get onto the agenda. Trade has become very similar. And some of you will remember the um, NAFTA negotiation distinct from the Canada Use Free Trade negotiation because when Bill Clinton became president and was responsible for, for uh, seeking the ratification of the agreement that was largely negotiated by the George H.W. Bush administration, in order to build a coalition that included some Democrats, he proposed adding side agreements, labor and environment side agreements, to try to build some support. There was also the creation of a development bank, the North American Development Bank in Dallas. And these were sweeteners designed to get some votes and say, yes, we really are dealing with these issues. Significantly about those, however, they were outside the agreement. And what environmental and labor groups discovered as NAFTA was implemented was that none of the dispute settlement mechanisms, none of the enforcement mechanisms that were inherent in NAFTA were available to labor and environment because it was outside the agreement. So we had these institutions, you're probably familiar with the Commission on Environmental Cooperation because it's based in Montreal, that could study, that could speak on issues, but had no ability to necessarily force policy change. And that was an important lesson, both for the negotiators and also for civil society, that being on the margins was good, but it wasn't good enough. And so what you saw subsequent to that was, whether it's the US Chilean free trade agreement, Canada's free trade agreement with Chile, um, or other agreements subsequently negotiated, labor and environment having had that NAFTA first step on the margins became part of the main body of the agreement. And, and so this was, this was progress because once you're in the main body you can, you can actually leverage trade enforcement mechanisms, whether if we're talking about NAFTA, chapter 11, chapter 20, chapter 19, to try to get enforcement uh, uh, on the issues that matter to you. However, in the NAFTA era and subsequently, there are other issues that really are important to civil society that have not got the same, uh, the same respect. One of them is uh, the role of regulatory harmonization. And even though many people in the union movement now in both our countries are public service union members as opposed to you know, manufacturing user, user members who are very concerned about processes that streamline regulation in a way that makes perhaps the country competitive vis-a-vis -vis business, but might also mean elimination of regulatory gates 
um, not necessarily a race to the bottom, but possibly an elimination of jobs within the public service that formerly were there to maintain systems that were, were regulatory. So there's a concern there. There's also, as many of you know, real movement uh, or real energy in civil society around new issues, whether an old issue, for example, I should mention is um, is women's advancement in trade, but there, there are others. People's concern over using the trade agenda to advance non-discrimination for people with different sexual orientations or even people of different racial backgrounds. Now this had not been on the trade agenda, but as you know, Canada put it on the trade agenda through the vehicle of the progressive uh, trade agenda that was articulated by the Canadian government as, as part of what they sought, not only in, in the renegotiated NAFTA agreement, but also in turning the TPP into a CPTPP, a Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. So all of that set expectations. Um, now, you might say, well, we didn't they sign this agreement in Buenos Aires? Isn't it over? Not so fast. It's not over because, of course, uh, the Americans can't do anything without a convoluted process, and we have a convoluted process. A word on why. When President Obama in 2014 asked the Congress for trade promotion authority, for a new grant of trade promotion authority to negotiate the TPP, but also to negotiate a transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership. It was met with sort of disbelief. Many Democrats remembered that Obama was a critic of the NAFTA. And all of a sudden he was asking for trade promotion authority to advance a corporate agenda across the Pacific. That was not what they expected. And so many Democrats, although they loved Obama, didn't really want to support this which forced the Obama administration to negotiate with Congress, which hated Obama, at least on the Republican side, but were, um, were willing to advance trade. And so they negotiated what in, we say in the United States was the most interventionist by Congress trade promotion authority grant since the 1974 Trade Act uh, that created the fast track process. When I say interventionist, I mean that it built in requirements for transparency, reports to Congress, consultations with Congress, all the way through the process, and then set timetables and new demands for what had to be presented. There is a submission package which is necessary for the administration to deliver to Congress in order to initiate the approval process. And it has not yet been submitted. What's included in the package? Six things. There is a final text of the agreement. Uh, we signed a draft, so uh, there's still been some cleanup work that's being done, so they want the final text. Secondly, draft implementing legislation. This is very unusual. Normally Congress writes their own legislation, but here they're asking for implementing legislation to be written by the administration, indicating which laws need to be changed in order to implement U.S. commitments. They want a labor market impact assessment, an environmental impact assessment from the agreement. They want a USITC report. That's the U.S. International Trade Commission that always assesses things. It's a bit like the Congressional Budget Office for budget issues or the General Accounting Office for, for other economic measures. The USITC, a fairly nonpartisan body, nonetheless part of the Commerce Department, needs to provide an assessment. And then finally, um, there needs to be an enforcement plan to ensure that commitments that are not upheld by Canada and Mexico or by particular corporations can be challenged and then, and then you can get some sort of satisfaction. And that is understood to apply in labor and environment because labor and environment in this agreement has been brought into the main body, but perhaps not to other areas. This has set off a negotiation within Washington, first on the draft text and second on the enforcement provisions, which have been the main concentration for civil society. On the draft text, to give you an example, Republicans in Congress were quite concerned about the language that Canada had asked for and put in the agreement that, prov that made it um, a violation of the agreement to discriminate in employment on the basis of gender or sexual orientation. This was not popular with Christian conservatives and others in Congress, so they asked that this be changed. And so the USTR made a footnote in the text that said this provision does not apply in the United States. Now, you might say, but, but we signed a deal. Ah, but the US is not changing Canada's commitment or Mexico's commitment. It's only changing what it's agreed to and leaves it to Canada and Mexico to say, well, that's not the deal, we want that back in, but they're only changing the rule there. Now, that happened in the text, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Second example, uh, the enforcement plan. Democrats have focused very much on the enforcement plan to make sure there are substantial teeth in the agreement so that if labor provisions aren't met, for example, we now um, have a very complicated automotive rule of origin that not only counts content, but counts 
whether the workers producing, say, automotive parts are making at least $16 an hour, because if they're not, that content value can't be included in formula. It's a very complicated uh, issue, and many people in civil society are concerned that there's a huge fudge factor for business, which understands this better than most of us in the civilian world, and they want to make sure there are teeth so that if there's a company that's violated that, that that can be addressed. Um, and you'll see a lot of Democrats have been focusing on that. So let's say that some of that negotiation is continuing. What, what happens next? Well, the next thing that will happen is the administration will submit this whole package, and there will be draft implementing legislation. And I emphasize draft because although Congress has asked for the draft, it's only a draft. And when that legislation hits Congress, Congress cannot amend it after it's introduced, but they can revise it before it's introduced because it's legislation. They're Congress. They can do that. So this is, this is the interesting bit. Um, and many people, uh, you might, we have such a weird system in the U.S. I apologize for that. But um, so a tariff bill, a trade bill, implementing legislation like this is considered what we would call a money bill, which means it must be introduced in the House. So the fact that the House is now under Democratic control means that the Senate really isn't the most important piece initially. It's what happens in the House. So Speaker Pelosi and her team have the ability to take this legislation and insert things. Perhaps they might say, we're striking that footnote that USTR put in about women and, and, and sexual orientation because we don't think that should be there. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. If Congress, if the Democrats decide they're going to change the legislation, once it's introduced, it is, it's got to be passed in exactly the same form by the Senate or rejected by both. So that gives Democrats a tremendous amount of, of leverage. On top of which, some of you will remember, if you go back a bit, um, the United States negotiated a free trade agreement with Colombia under the George W. Bush administration, that, and Canada, of course, followed along with a free trade agreement. They negotiated with Colombians. You passed yours first. One of the reasons you passed yours first was that Nancy Pelosi didn't like it. And some of it she didn't like in the agreement, but also she was dealing with uh, George W. Bush, and she wanted as much leverage to get stuff out of the Republican administration as she wanted. So there was no clock on her. She just said, well, I can introduce this if I feel like it. She held it up for four years. And the Bush people were mad, and business was mad, but nobody could force it. And she was waiting for somebody to give her a good deal. Maybe an immigration bill, maybe more money for environment. I mean, she's, she's got limited power, but she knows how to use what she's got, and she's in the same position now. So if the Trump administration thinks they've got a great victory, uh, they're just waiting for a rubber stamp from Congress, they're going to find that Speaker Pelosi is going to hold out, I suspect. Does and it have it, to be passed by a simple majority, or does it be the 60 rule in the Senate? No, it's a simple majority in both chambers. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be, it can't be amended. So once it's in, it's, it's stuck. But yeah, it's just simple majority in both, both chambers. So that's the, um, so those are the levers. And so civil society has potentially great influence here. So where are we? Well. As usual, the business community, if you count them in civil society, is the best organized. They, the large companies who see some potential benefit organize small business. There are two coalitions, a past USMCA coalition, which has been organized by some of the more um, successful lobbying groups, and a chamber of commerce group that is supporting USMCA now that includes a lot of smaller businesses. During the course of the negotiation, big businesses have been very wary about saying anything about USMCA or new NAFTA. And the reason is they don't want a Trump tweet that says, at Ford uh, is hurting American workers. Because what business is very keen on is when Trump puts your uh, Twitter handle, your company's Twitter handle, in a negative tweet, it hurts your stock price. And a lot of CEOs get paid on stock options, and they don't want the top stock price tanked, because they're going to hear about it. So what they've done instead is use their trade associations uh, the, the American Automotive Trade Policy Council, the uh, you know steel, work, steel Association, the Manufacturers Association, National Association of Manufacturers, to be the front people on criticizing or intervening on the trade agreement. And they've been very, very forthright in participating in these corporate coalitions to advance uh, getting the agreement passed. And there is very little corporate dissent. Although they probably like a slightly different agreement, they just want to see this put forward in order to end the uncertainty and move on to what, for most US businesses, is the real fight, which is China, which has much more broad and bipartisan support than picking on Canada and Mexico, even though apparently you're a national security risk. Um, 
So that's, that's the first issue. Then there's the second issue, immigration. Not really with Canada, although it could be an issue with Canada. Immigration with Mexico has always been an issue in U.S.-Mexico relations, and there are there is a very significant civil society network that cares about immigration. And many of these people are concerned about the Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals, what we call the DACA kids or the Dreamers. They're also concerned about the status of um, uh, undocumented workers who've come over. They also are concerned about future immigration. And, uh, and what they hear from Trump is enforcement first, the big wall. So I have five minutes. I'm going to talk really fast. Um, they're also looking for a trade-off, and many of them advance the idea that if Nancy Pelosi can get an immigration concession out of Trump, perhaps deferred action on childhood arrivals, then maybe the USMCA is worth passing. That's a very big chip, and it won't make some Republicans happy, but that's one of the things in play. With regard to labor and environment, they're in the best position they've been in in a trade agreement in a long time. Robert Lighthizer has cultivated both communities, particularly labor. You'll notice that not only was Trump not mentioned here in the video from AFL-CIO, but there was, no, there was no criticism of Trump either. A lot of what Lighthizer has advanced, he's, he's a nice, uh, he grew up in Ashtabula, uh, Ohio. He's concerned about the same agenda, and he has tried to cultivate Sherrod Brown and many Democrats who are, uh, who are very pro-labor because he knew from the beginning he needed their support to get this thing through. So, so labor and environment are, at the moment, tentatively okay with the agreement. Um, that doesn't just say SEIU and some of the public service unions haven't got doubts, but they're kind of watching to see how this plays out. They've gotten a lot potentially in this agreement. They may see the potential for more, but they've been relatively um, calm. What will make the difference? In the next few months, a couple of things will make the difference. The one, first is timing. We are coming very close to the 2020 election. And you know we're always in election mode in the US. It is entirely possible, given the timetable, that if Nancy Pelosi introduces this into the Congress in end of March, say, that given the amount of time that the Senate and the House can take, we would still be debating this in early 2020. Once you get into 2020, and frankly, even now, many Democrats will find the agreement OK, but don't want to give Trump a win. And that's going to start affecting the politics. And I think if the US doesn't move before early 2020, most people will say, you know, it's good, but I could do better in the, under a next president, whether it's President Bernie or President Kamala Harris or whatever. And they'll gamble that it's better to stall on this and see if you can, you know, reboot. I know you don't want to hear that, but I'm just saying that. And I'm sure Trudeau doesn't want to hear that either. The next piece that I think to, is worth watching is the role of Canada and Mexico. The Trump administration, as you know, is in entirely shameless on these things. And the White House has said to the, both the Trudeau government and to the, the government in Mexico um, that it expects Canada and Mexico to be on the Hill pushing for passage of this agreement. Even though neither is extremely thrilled with the agreement, we expect you to go and sell it. And uh, as, as Mick Mulvaney, the chief of staff, uh, said to a group I was, I was listening in the audience, it was off the record, but I'm quoting him anyway, um, essentially said, look, they need the agreement. The uncertainty's killing them. If you want it, you got to go out and lobby for it. Well, Canada and Mexico have taken a common position, which is not unless steel and aluminum tariffs are raised on the 232, and not if you impose automotive tariffs on us as well. Perfectly reasonable position, in my view. But that is also a level of negotiation. If that's satisfied, and Canada and Mexico are then expected by Washington to go and work on the Hill, they are both Canada and Mexico more popular with Congress than Trump is, then the question will be what will Canadian and Mexican civil society say about whether Canada and Mexico, their governments, should be lobbying on the Hill in favor of an agreement. And I think that will be a discussion among civil societies, among networks, labor unions in Canada talking to labor unions in the US, environmental groups, and so on and so forth. So that, I think, it was meant to be a, a sort of tee up for the next two talks. So I'll stop there, uh, but happy to answer questions as things go on. Great, with two minutes to spare. Um, well, you could trade it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Monetize it. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Laura for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the Faculty of Public Affairs for organizing such a such an event. I think it's something I'll talk to my own dean about organizing at Ducam. So uh, I, I like this model, and uh, thank you for being here. So uh, mm -hmm. I titled my presentation, Future Directions in Canada-Mexico Relations. I'll be switching a bit 
perspective. Uh, so it'll be a different kind of talk from uh, Chris, but uh, I hope that will generate debate and maybe controversy as well. Um, anyway, so what I'm trying to do is trying to look at how uh, Mexico-Canada relations uh, look like at the moment where uh, the USMCA agreement is being uh, ratified. Um, my starting point is uh, something that I called in a previous article, uh, Far Away, So Close, uh, this uh, movie by, uh, oh, I forgot his name now. It's a, a German movie. Um, anyway, um, the idea is that Mexico and Canada are very close, but are also rather far away. And this shows very uh, strikingly in the way they relate to each other. And it creates a permanent paradox uh, in the relationship between these two countries. Uh, we've all heard this, this discourse about Mexico and Canada being natural allies and about Mexico and Canada being uh, together in North America and being together to uh, preserve NAFTA and so on and so forth. But uh, we need to remember that there's been uh, a number of important crises in uh, Mexico-Canada relations that uh, show us that there's something else going on that needs to be taken into account before we think that Mexico and Canada are, in fact, natural allies and that they will fight together for USMCA or whatever. So the first crisis is uh, the Mexican visa crisis of 2009, where uh, Canada unilaterally imposed uh, visas on Mexico's tourists, and not only unilaterally imposed, but also imposed them on a very short uh, on a very short-term basis, so uh, from essentially one day to the next, Mexicans needed visas to come to Canada, and Mexico was very hurt because this was in the middle of negotiating the Security and Prosperity Partnership in North America, which was supposed precisely to uh, deal with this kinds of issues through consultation and uh, so forth. So um, it was, uh, in Mexico, it was perceived as a slap in the face and the Mexican government reacted accordingly, uh, and the SPP was dead and buried very quickly afterwards. Um, but it's not only Mexico who has been a victim of Canadian unilateralism. Canada has been hurt by the fact that Mexico has been negotiating a number of uh, free trade agreements in Latin America that are uh, essentially uh, seen as a hub and spoke system in which Mexico is the hub and Canada is simply one of the spokes and Mexico has free trade agreements with many other Latin American countries. And Mexico has not been very supportive of Canadian efforts to extend its own free trade uh, system to Colombia, Chile, or other countries. So um, Mexico and Canada have also this, this tension there, um, not, not entirely um, productive of a natural alliance. The way to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis has been a very traditional way, a Mexican way of, of doing this, which is through compartmentalization. Uh, this was not created for Canada, it was actually created for the US, in which uh, the way to deal uh, with uh, the elephant and the border, Mexico has compartmentalized all its different uh, relationships, so trade is never mixed with uh, culture or with security or with uh, whatever other relationship is there in order to avoid the fact that one a, a crisis in one of these dimensions might create a crisis in the entire relationship. And that's a way to survive living next to the United States. And uh, Mexico has also developed a compartmentalization and a depoliticization of uh, its day-to-day uh, -day relationships with Canada. So even in the midst of uh, the visa crisis and all these problems, Mexico and Canada and and Mexican and Canadian officials uh, usually got together and they're uh, far away from, from the spotlight and decided on um, very small marginal, but on the end, rather uh, important and substantial uh, ways to make things work. Because after all, trade is trade and money is money and both want it going. So um, that's one, one big element. And the other big element has already been raised. Of course, it's the United States, Mexico, and Canada compete for the attention of the United States. And therefore, they're not always, um, thank you, um, not always uh, ready to collaborate with one another when they see it might be to their advantage to negotiate alone. Uh, the most striking um, 
example of this was uh, Krista Freeland saying, precisely so, Canada will negotiate a loan because it is to Canada's advantage to do so. And then, of course, she discovered that Mexico could uh, negotiate faster and quicker and therefore had to cut short a uh, diplomatic trip to Europe in order to come back to Washington and negotiate what she had not done previously. Anyway, so um, that's part of it. So I'm, I'm always very wary when I hear this talk about uh, North American trilateralism. I wonder what exactly it is because it's, it's hard to see. Uh, another example of, of this uh, vague trilateralism is the fact that Canada has built the tradition of jumping into a moving train. Uh, NAFTA was also negotiated with Canada moving into an agreement that was already uh, ongoing, was being negotiated out of fear of being left out of a more comprehensive trade agreement between Mexico and the US. It was a way to protect whatever Canada had acquired. Uh, I, don't, I don't have the English word in my mind, but the French word is acquis as uh, uh, the, 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 the acquis, the, the privilege is already won, negotiated through the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement of uh, 88. So that is one thing. And then the other thing is that we should uh, very quickly discard the idea of uh, EU-style, so European Union-style deepening and integration. Uh, NAFTA was negotiated as an agreement that explicitly excluded the idea of furthering integration and the, and the um, collapse of the security and the prosperity partnership shows us how difficult it was under the NAFTA agreement to um, actually uh, deepen integration. It is true that labor and environment have been brought into the USMCA agreement, but I'm not entirely sure that this will change anything in terms of creating the framework for deepening integration beyond uh, simply trade and investment. So going to uh, the USMCA agreement, what I would like to show you here is uh, the fact that this is a precarious agreement. It, even the name nobody agrees on. Uh, it's an agreement without an agreed name. I'm, I'm showing you the, the French version of the uh, Canadian name, which puts Canada first. Then the US puts, of course, its own name first. And then in Mexico, it's even worse because uh, the official uh, website talks about an agreement, but the Mexican government sent a bill proposing the ratification of a treaty. So uh, just this is anecdotal, but it's, it shows you how uh, this is an agreement to disagree in the best of cases. Um, it is also an innovative agreement and something that nobody thought would be a good thing. So it's uh, the first. Uh, trade agreement to have uh, a fixed uh, sun, uh, sunset clause. So we all know that it's, it's due to end 16 years after its ratification, whenever that happens. And also it has to be uh, renegotiated every six years. So actually, uh, if uh, US entrepreneurs and others are thinking about USMCA bringing certainty, I'm sorry to tell them that they're wrong because actually uncertainty is built into the treaty or agreement. And uh, we will be hearing about USMCA and we will be having this repeated crisis about uh, ratification and so on at least every six years and then a big one at the end of the 16 year period. And then we don't know what will happen. So um, this is not what I would call certainty, right? Um, there's many things that have changed in, in and the switch from NAFTA to USMCA, so there's uh, the question about automobiles, and I think this is probably the most interesting part of, of the agreement because it builds on what was essentially the most successful part of NAFTA, creating a vertically integrated automobile industry in uh, North America, and the new uh, features of the USMCA uh, actually work into uh, strengthening this uh, vertical integration, the more regional content you have, well, the more integrated the industry might become. It still needs to be seen whether the $16 uh, per hour minimum will actually be enforced. We haven't seen any movements on that front in Mexico, but uh, apparently there's teeth to that. And um, I guess uh, the, the Lopez Obrador government is actually waiting for uh, ratification before moving forward rather than uh, uh, going ahead on the first time. Another interesting element of the USMCA is a whole chapter on uh, corruption, 
which is, of course, meant to uh, be a sweetener, a political sweetener in the US and possibly Canada. It's not that interesting in Mexico, but still it gives attention to the fact that uh, corruption has uh, a higher political uh, priority these days, and therefore it's been included in the, in the agreement. I won't talk much longer about ratification because that has been uh, already discussed, but just to uh, remember that Mexico has been waiting for the U.S. to go ahead first. And uh, there's this uh, balancing act that's been going on between uh, waiting for the U.S. to ratify and, of course, to lift the, 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 the tariffs, but also trying to avoid Trump saying, well, it's either you ratify the deal as it is, or there's no deal because we'll uh, get out of NAFTA, and then there will be no trade agreement at all. So it's, it's, it's a, a difficult act, and the Mexican government, the Canadian government as well, are trying to find a way through this maze, because if, if they also don't want to provoke Trump into tweeting NAFTA is over as of uh, noon today. So uh, that, that's a, something going on. Um, another thing that's interesting to think about when we talk about uh, these trade agreements is the fact that trade is there and it has grown enormously. So what I put in, in the, on the presentation and the PowerPoint is the growth of uh, trade between Mexico and Canada. I only found the trade in goods, uh, so the services are not included, but it's uh, gone to over, uh, over $30 billion uh, from uh, in, in, in 2018, and uh, it's uh, also it's also interesting to note that there is an enormous growth in numbers, but there is tremendous stability in proportion. So um, you'll see that uh, in terms of trade, Mexico uh, provides for six to seven, so two thirds of the goods sold to Canada. And so there's a big imbalance in the, in the balance of payments. It also works the other way around. So when we look at investment, we'll see that investment has grown enormously, that uh, the Mexican part of uh, investment flows is not insignificant. It's around uh, 12%, but, and it has grown uh, with time, and it has remained stable at 12% as well. So it's interesting to see this paradox of, of an enormous growth in terms of, of volume and enormous stability in terms of proportions. Another thing that I would like to point the attention to, and that this will help us think why, um, why the, US, the NAFTA USMCA agreements have been negotiated the way they have, has to do with the fact that soft power is also an important element that we need to think about, and uh, soft power declines itself in, in different ways, but it excludes at least uh, theoretically both uh, military and economic power. So there's other ways of, for countries to influence their, their foreign policies. So what I want to show in this final uh, slide is um, the number of travelers. Oh, it's still in French there. OK, anyway. Um, so Canadians going to Mexico and Mexicans coming to Canada. Unfortunately, there's no data for Canadians in Mexico in 1994. It only starts in 2008. Uh, here, the, the, the trend has been growing, but the, the proportion has changed. And that has to do, of course, with the fact that uh, for a number of years, Mexicans needed a visa to come to Canada. And so for a while, they actually did stop coming to Canada. Once the visa requirement was lifted, they uh, they came back. It is also interesting to note that it's not on the slide, but uh, the, the amount of money Mexicans spend in Canada has uh, very little to do with the amount of money Canadians spend in Mexico. So it's a very unbalanced uh, uh, trade situation there. And it also shows uh, the, the appeal of Mexico as a, as a tourist destination for Canadians. And it's also important to uh, note that not only for uh, tourists that go and spend two weeks, but the, the snowbird phenomenon is an important phenomenon. And there's communities that have come to depend on uh, the money brought by the snowbirds, especially around uh, Puerto Vallarta and uh, the coastal region there. Uh, 
snowbirds are are important, and uh, they they provide for uh, an important Canadian presence in Mexico. Of course, uh, we need to talk about students. I was one of them once, and uh, I, I stayed. Oh, thank you. And. Um, the, the number of students has grown, um, I think, by 10, so there were about uh, 3,000 in 2000, and there's about 30,000 US uh, Mexican students in Canada today. Um, there's no uh, comparable uh, flow. On the other direction, uh, Canadian students don't tend to register in Mexican universities, uh, maybe only for a semester, and then they only need a tourist visa. But uh, they're very active in working in collaboration with Mexican civil society movements, uh, solidarity, uh, uh, migrant rights, uh, worker rights, uh, indigenous rights, and so on. So there's an important Canadian student presence in Mexico as well. And uh, I have to conclude with uh, with Roma, the movie which has caused so much uh, uproar in Canada and has been extremely popular, and it's also a symbol of uh, Mexican soft power in Canada. So all these things have to be factored somehow in the uh, Mexico-Canada relationship. Finally, uh, I'll, the, I'll, I'll try to look into the crystal ball and talk about uh, Lopez Obrador. And uh, the most important thing uh, we need to talk about is the fact that uh, USMCA was negotiated by former President Peña Nieto, but actually it was masterminded by Lopez Obrador and his team because uh, uh, Peña Nieto was a lame duck president that had no political authority left, and it was actually a uh, Lopez Obrador team that moved in and told Peña Nieto which were the elements they were willing to agree upon, and there was sort of an agreement to the fact that Peña Nieto would uh, have the glory of signing the agreement in Buenos Aires, but the agreement actually reflects uh, López Obrador's priorities, and it will be uh, ratified at some point by the new government. It is interesting to uh, look at the return of the site room, how uh, entrepreneurs were invited to negotiate on the Mexican side, even though this was López Obrador and therefore uh, a leftist uh, government, and how uh, the side room worked as usual, so entrepreneurs were invited, but civil society organizations and most likely, most especially uh, unions were not. So that's, that also tells us something about the position of uh, Lopez Obrador vis-a-vis -vis the USMCA. Finally, I would like to take a look at the Lima Group and the Venezuela crisis because that was a, a point of uh, high politics, uh, collaboration between Canada and Mexico that has gone overboard with the arrival of López Obrador and the decision to return to more traditional Mexican foreign policy tropes, uh, non-intervention, uh, mediation for the resolution of internal conflicts, and so on. And therefore, Mexico has, for all practical purposes, left the Lima Group and has been working with uh, Uruguay and some European countries in trying to uh, propose an alternative version uh, to uh, the Venezuelan crisis. So uh, just to conclude, because I'm probably out of time by now, um, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the question of social legitimacy. And I think this is the one thing that will most likely change with uh, López Obrador. So the side room will be still be there. The, the, the constraints of trade and investment will still be there. Um, except that Lopez Obrador has a different constituency he needs to please, and so there will be some changes in what I expect will be um, mostly the, the, the discourse and the tropes of Mexican foreign policy, Mexican trade policy, but essentially I suspect there will be little change in the way day-to-day -day, uh, Mexico-Canada relations work, so we will be back to compartmentalization and depoliticization. So uh, I'd like to say thanks first to Laura McDonald for the opportunity to be here. Um, and she asked me to set the stage, at least I think this is what she asked me to do. This is what I, I'm going to do. So, <laughs> um, In terms of sort of the politics around the new NAFTA for Canada and the involvement of different stakeholders in the process. Um, I like this picture because everybody's looking in a different direction, um, which is actually a little bit how I think the dynamics of this, this went. This is the day that they signed the, the agreement. Um, 
And and my comments, I think, are going to be complementary. There, I'm I'm headed in a little bit of a different direction, and I, I think I'm going to try and show you a little bit of how the sausage is made um, uh, when it comes to stakeholder engagement uh, by governments. Um, and uh, I thought also that the video was a good way to set the stage because one of the messages that I thought was important that was conveyed in that was. Um, when uh, the, the woman spoke and said, labor is stronger when it's united. And so I, I think you'll hear as I go through my comments um, how united and fragmented positions end up playing out in what trade agreements can look like. All right. So on the surface, you know, the politics of the deal as a whole for Canada really aren't particularly exciting because everyone in Canada, for the most part, is pro-NAFTA. Uh, there's widespread recognition that Canada is a trading country and that we rely on NAFTA for our economic well-being. Um, all major political parties, including the NDP, uh, took a position of being in favor of NAFTA. Organized labor, for the most part, has taken a position. Uh, and citizens. And so this isn't the same in the United States, uh, where there's there I think there is more vocal um, uh, fragmentation about about the deal as a whole. But within the sort of big tent that we're all pro NAFTA, um, there are certainly different approaches and interests and emphasis that that different uh, groups would would put on different aspects of what makes a tr good trade deal and for who. And I think there's also actually quite a bit of art in the public representation of what a good deal looks like to the country and how political leadership goes about selling that deal to the public as something that is good for it. Um, so I want to start by emphasizing that it is key and a totally normal part of trade negotiations to engage groups that are expected to be impacted by those trade negotiations and what they might look like. Countries sign trade agreements because they think it's going to be good for their country, good for their businesses, workers, and citizens. Um, but it's also known at the outset that not all aspects of every trade agreement are going to be good for everyone's interests. And so it's important for governments to anticipate the needs and the interests of the groups that are expected to be impacted, both those who are expected to benefit, but also those who could potentially be hurt. And negotiators also need to be educated so that they don't unknowingly trade something away that they weren't even really aware was important um, and that could potentially uh, hurt domestic interests. And so overall, negotiators need to understand they, you know, they have this big picture goal of figuring out what that final package is going to look like and is it worth signing on to, yes or no, because ultimately that is the decision governments make. It's, it's, an, it's a whole package and it's either it's good for the country and they're going to implement it or it's bad. Now negotiations are also highly technical. Um, NAFTA has thousands of tariff line item numbers. Negotiators can't be expected to be experts on every single one of them and so they frequently speak to business about you know very specific technical issues um, in terms of what what works for you and what doesn't uh, in a trade agreement. Now the previous conservative government and the current liberal government have both engaged uh, stakeholders as part of their trade policy process. They've done so differently. The Conservative government, I think, was known to be fairly business friendly and it prioritized the interests of the business community as well as uh, farmers and agricultural uh, interests as well as small business. I think the Liberal government is seen to be more union friendly and has done more to um, reflect the interests of organized labor as well as indigenous groups in the new NAFTA. But I wanna be clear that both governments engaged all of these stakeholders, but their emphasis and prioritization of what they heard and then what they did with the information they received is different. It's one thing to consult, it's another thing to actually do something with that. Um, and so what were sort of the big kind of pieces of NAFTA from a stakeholder perspective? Um, I recently gave a talk in the States on the Kuzma, explaining to them, because they have no idea that our government decided to call USMCA anything else. And so I, I talked about the, the three C's of Kuzma, cars, cows, and conflict resolution. And, um, but I'm mostly going to stick to cars and cows today. 
because this is where most of the political attention was paid, at least from a stakeholder perspective. So on cars, Canada ultimately agreed to a 75% North American content rule, meaning that 75% of car needs to be sourced and made in North America, using 70% North American steel and aluminum, and that at least 40 to 45% of the car needs to be made using high wage labor, which is defined in the agreement as at least $16 US per hour. That was, by the way, a Canadian proposal. Um, and on the surface, I think if you turned on your television, you would think that uh, the Canadian auto sector was actually quite happy with the outcome of NAFTA. Flavio Volpe, who I know and like very much, was frequently on our television screens talking about how the government was doing a great job working on NAFTA. But my point earlier about the art of, of selling a trade deal is that I think within the auto sector, it very much depends on who you asked. And that's because in the Canadian auto industry, it's um, located entirely in the province of Ontario, something to bear in mind. And there are four major stakeholder groups. So there are the big three auto manufacturers, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. There are foreign manufacturers who have plants in Canada. These are Honda and Toyota. There's also a couple of truck manufacturers. There are auto parts producers. So the big ones for Canada are Linamar, Magna, and Martin Rea. Um, and there are many, many, many smaller auto parts producers in Canada, companies. There's also organized labor, which in NAFTA negotiations was largely represented by Jerry Dias, who also was on our television screens a lot. And these four sets of stakeholders don't actually all want the same thing out of a trade deal. And so if you were paying attention in the NAFTA negotiations, you would know that we only ever heard from two groups, and those were Jerry Dias and Flavia Volpe. Jerry Dias representing, you know, he's pushing the, the wage, the high wage um, provisions in, in on autos and Flavio Volpe from the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. And it's my view that these were the ones who were out talking about the deal because these are the interests that were reflected in the final NAFTA. For organized labor, the new NAFTA ensures Canada's high wages and good working conditions represent less of a competitive disadvantage than those of Mexico. And for auto parts, the new NAFTA ensures that more North American parts need to be in every North American car. And since all of the big uh, parts producers also have presence in the United States, um, they're much less threatened by a strong rule of origin, NAFTA rule of origin, than they are by parts coming in from outside of North America. And so who we never heard from was the big three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. This is for, I think, a couple of reasons. One is because their American headquarters essentially call the shots on what their positions are going to be towards trade deals, but also um, because really they just wanted the status quo. They wanted the 62.5% rule of origin, and this is what would have been cheapest for them. Uh, similarly, the foreign um, auto manufacturers, so Toyota and Honda, in a way they don't really have a horse in this race. Their Canadian operations are entirely to produce cars for the North American market. Um, they're not sending cars back and forth across the Canada-US border the way that the big three manufacturing um, operations have developed. Uh, and, and they have much more of a sort of build where we sell model. And so ultimately, they also would have preferred the 62.5% rule of origin. But it's my suspicion that just sort of keeping quiet, consulting quietly with government, but not taking a big public position is what they decided was the best position for them. And so governments, when they are faced with winners and losers in a trade agreement, one of the things that they can do is encourage the winners to be out there publicly talking about how great a trade deal is. And this is what you know, Chris mentioned, the US and Mexico are, are down on the hill trying to convince Americans about why we need the deal, and it's because, um, or, or why we think it's a good deal, and it's because they know we need the deal. And so if those who are in favor of a deal are sort of out promoting it very loudly, then they can drown the voices of those who think that a deal isn't such a good thing. Or if those who don't think a deal is such a good thing just don't speak out at all, then for the average Canadian, you look at your television screens, it seems that Otto is happy. That guy Flavio is always on television and he seems pretty happy. So, so I guess it's a good deal for the auto industry. And again, I, I do know Flavio and I like him very much, but I'm just explaining that um, you know, we didn't hear from the big three 
Uh, and, and they have been very silent, and I think this is largely because they don't like the agreement. And you'll note that GM is leaving Canada, so, uh, or the, the one plant is leaving anyway. And so um, they are voting with their feet, even though they haven't been very loud about the agreement. So what about dairy, cows? Um, in the final negotiation, Canada offered 3.6% market access to the US, and we also agreed to dismantle regulatory barriers associated with something called Class 7 dairy. I'm happy to explain more about that later, but I won't for now. Uh, and we also agreed to limit exports on powdered milk and formula. I can also explain more about that if people are interested. But we've heard that can the Canadian dairy sector was not very happy about the deal. And certainly, I think across the board, they were not. And so we heard a united position from dairy farmers that they did not want Canada to allow any access to the Canadian dairy market in NAFTA. And they held the same position on the Canada-Europe trade agreement as well as the trans Partnership. And in all of these agreements, in the end, Canada gave somewhere between about 3 and 3.5% access. Now, to many people, 3.5% might not seem like a very big deal. Dairy farmers might sound like they're belly aching um, because isn't sort of 96% still intact if we only gave up 3.5%, but that's not actually how it works in the supply management system. And when you start to add up all of this incremental access that has been offered in a very short amount of time, actually the viability of the supply management system is something that, that um, begins to come into play. And so via CETA, TPP, and now NAFTA, we've offered more than 10% access to foreign competition imports to our dairy market. And all of this impacts just one part of the supply management system. So if you think about supply management as a stool, a three-legged stool, it impacts just one leg of that stool. And eventually, adjustments are required to those other two legs. And if it isn't all done just right, what happens to the stool, right? So what do governments do to help? Well. They can keep farmers whole by compensating them for their losses. Uh, and this is what trade policy was, has always sort of set out to do. If you, if you talk to sort of classic trade economists, they would say there's winners and losers in trade. The winners win more than the losers lose, and therefore the winners should compensate the losers. But when it comes time to actually compensate them, it seems that suddenly pockets start to close, and it, it, it isn't always a smooth process. But to that end, I think it's important to remember that the average farmer in Canada is about 56 years old. That's farmers writ large, not dairy farmers. I, I couldn't get my hands on the stats easily. Um, and there are more farmers that are over the age of 70 than under the age of 35 today. And so I think it's quite understandable that dairy farmers whose retirement is entirely locked up in the quota for their cows want to ensure that their quota value isn't going to deteriorate as more foreign milk comes in, just as they're thinking about retirement. And so one thing the government can do is compensate them for their losses, and that provides some benefits. The only other point I would make about this is that, you know, Quebec was the loudest in its opposition to the new NAFTA, and I think this was largely because um, the deal was concluded first in the final days of a provincial election campaign, so all candidates were opposed to NAFTA. Um, but also because Quebec didn't really gain very much for these losses in dairy. It, Quebec's interests were hurt in a couple of other areas as well, and they didn't have the sort of win on autos that Ontario got, and so you heard much more loudly from, from Quebec than from Ontario that the province wasn't very happy about it. And in fact, Premier Ford has been down in the States a number of times trying to help promote the agreement. So I do just want to highlight, am I at? Five minutes yet? Okay. I do just want to highlight a couple of other things um, that are in the agreement from a stakeholder perspective. So the first thing I think that's sort of most important is that Canada has maintained access to the U.S. market. And so this is actually the biggest thing for Canadian business is just still having access. Um, the other thing that, that uh, was discussed a lot by the government is that Chapter 19 was, was retained. So this is about... Um, uh, dispute settlement. Um, and this is largely, I think, a symbolic, the reason that I think it became so important was because it was the same thing that was really important in the original trade deal, Canada-US, and then the same thing that was important in NAFTA. So it's kind of taken on mythical standards in, in or mythical proportions in Canada in a way that it, 
it uh, perhaps otherwise would not have. Um, Canada also eliminated Chapter 11, um, and, and the US as well, around investor-state dispute, which really I do think serves the interests of Canadian civil society. Environment and labor groups have been calling for this, and certainly big companies have not been calling for this. Um, the agreement also, as has been discussed, contains labor and environment chapters. These were largely borrowed from the Transfic Partnership. So from a Canadian perspective, these were not particularly controversial because they were essentially the same commitments were negotiated by a previous government, conservative government, and then were put in the TPP and then eventually they made their way into NAFTA. So um, from a Canadian perspective, these are not controversial. And moving forward to Chris's point, the House Democrats may very well seek even stronger provisions in labour and environment. And the truth is, from a policy perspective, Canada could quite easily sign on to those, I think. Uh, it's more a political issue around kind of the ratification timetable as to whether or not we would entertain that. Um, and then there's also some sort of small provisions to protect Canadian obligations to Indigenous peoples as well as special programs to boost um, um, businesses owned by Indigenous populations, which is new to NAFTA and a positive thing. But things that were not achieved in NAFTA um, were the two big requests of business. The two top requests of Canadian business were to improve government procurement and to end Buy America provisions and modernize the list of professionals that qualify for NAFTA temporary entry visas. Uh, in fact, Canada withdrew altogether from Chapter 13, which is the government procurement chapter. And so we continue to have government procurement with Mexico via TPP, but we will have no government procurement chapter in place with the United States once USMCA is ratified. So that was business community's number one ask. And then their other big ask was around temporary entry uh, provisions, which uh, I, that is my area of research. And so I've read the chapter, I've done a line by line comparison and there's a handful of words that are different. Um, other big sort of concessions that were made by Canada include around de minimis, um, ex which is uh, duty-free shipping. We went from $20 Canadian to $150 Canadian, retail sector of Canada, not very happy about that. We also increased IP protections on biologics and copyright protections, both of which will come with additional costs. Um, and there may be further changes actually around the biologics uh, issue and again, Canada, I think, could play ball with the Democrats if necessary. And so I think the picture, though, that emerges, and I'm, I'm wrapping up now, um, is that I think you see that insofar as there was a shift between the way the current Liberal government um, has engaged in stakeholder, um, um, stakeholder engagement and, and the Canadians, is that you do see there's a slightly greater influence of civil society in these negotiations. You know, the list on the left largely reflects the interest of specific civil society groups, although um, I know we'll be hearing from some of those groups later today. It's my suspicion that you'll hear it's more talk than action, but I will leave it to the speakers to comment. Um, but then on the right, the Canadian business community, I think, can accept the new NAFTA, but they don't particularly like it. I think that they feel that the Canadian government's priorities were misaligned with those of the Trump administration and that the government deployed too much political capital in areas that um, they were never going to achieve, including a gender chapter. And so from their perspective, I think that it probably failed to make gains in areas that the business community would have liked to prioritize, including government procurement. And so one of the things that I would like to close with, though, is just a reminder that I think we have to remember that it was the Americans who were driving this bus the whole time. And so in areas where the Canadian government um, uh, wanted to get things done and they were aligned with the Americans, we were able to do so. So on things like autos, the elimination of Chapter 11, labor and environment chapters, we're very much taking the lead from the US on these issues. And the chapters are only as as ambitious as the US wanted to be. Um, and then in areas where the US didn't want to move at all, like temporary entry, and there's long historical reasons that I anticipated there would be no change, um, we made, we'd made absolutely no progress, and that was expected. So I'm going to leave it there. I just want to highlight that this is a new report, a trilateral report that um, I wrote the Canadian chapter, but there's also Mexican and US chapters. Not chapters, it's very short. 
five five page reports um, about uh, the new NAFTA, and it's available either from uh, it's pinned at the top of my Twitter page or from CG, which was the organization that funded it. Thanks. Okay, so we have a, a nice chunk of time for questions and uh, discussion. So I will open the floor. Can I ask you to introduce yourselves before you ask your question? And go to the mics. Thank you, Laura. I'm, uh, I'm Jean Laudelin. I, I teach at the, the Patterson School. Uh, my question is to the three presenters. Uh, uh, the three of you have emphasized uh, that uh, the new agreement, the way in which it was negotiated, and everything that needs to be done still introduces a large degree of uncertainty. Um, to what, what, what are the impacts, the long-term impacts, the structural impacts of that uncertainty, especially the one that's built in the agreement relative in particular to uh, the renegotiation? Okay. But, but not just that, I mean, overall. So one of the things, and I, th I thought uh, Julian brought this up very well, um, is not only the uncertainty of whether this gets ratified, but even if it's ratified, the fact that we have these windows for revision, renegotiation, talking about the agreement again. I I'm as guilty as anybody in Washington, but those of you who remember, for a long time, if you said, well, we should update NAFTA, we should make some changes, the American response pretty much uniformly was, y you can't reopen NAFTA. If you do, the whole thing will come apart. It wasn't that popular here. So even though the establishment is blamed for you know being rah rah about NAFTA, they knew there was vulnerability. And um, put it a different way, from the moment this the NAFTA was completed in every president elect presidential election after that, from 1992, which was the George H. W. Bush Clinton election, onward, we had at least one candidate opposed to NAFTA running for president. And it was Ross Perot, it was Ralph Nader, and then by the time we get past the Ralph Nader era, we had a significant Democratic op opponent, whether it was Hillary Clinton and Obama, and then by the time you get to 2016, which was sort of a, a bit of a little earthquake, you had all of the major party candidates in the U.S. and some of the minor ones all opposed to NAFTA. So we've seen this sort of unhappiness uh, building in the U.S. in a way which I think is quite right. Julian and, and Meredith pointed out that, that the NAFTA consensus was much stronger in Canada and in Mexico, and people were more ex accepting of it, but it had really never gotten that kind of traction in the US. The six-year revision is very clever, because a six-year revision means post-Trump, even if he gets reelected. It also meets, means post AMLO. So who knows what we'll have in Mexico. So that adds uncertainty. I mean, it does say we can go back, but it means there's a guaranteed who knows what we're going to be dealing with in six years on top of the question of whether we're going to get it, and then on top of the question of whether it'll all be eliminated. Um, I think the uncertainty works against a business that's trying to assess how their supply chain needs to be structured. We've seen businesses be very cautious in terms of making decisions, very reluctant to take on additional risk as they, as they look at this. And there's something else that I, I just flag as I, th I think will be a source of ongoing challenge for, for the governments. And that is, just as NAFTA got a lot of negative attention because people said, oh, this is causing jobs to move overseas. But in effect, automation was a big part of that as well, but didn't have the political uh, sort of uh, targeting that, that trade agreements had done. We're also facing the same thing here in that one of the great challenges for supply chains is the emergence of 3D or additive manufacturing. One of the reasons supply chains went to Vietnam or Malaysia or, um, or other parts of the world was lower labor cost and getting the price of that widget you need down to a couple of pennies. And transportation costs had lowered significantly enough that you, know, you could buy that widget in a far-flung country, bring it back, and it would be OK. NAFTA. 2.0 or USMCA won't be as bad for Canadian and Mexican workers as it will be for Vietnamese and other far-flung workers because technology will lead to a contraction of supply chains and manufacturing platforms like Platform North America, which although they're going to be reorganized here will still be inside the fence as opposed to outside the fence. And I think that changes the politics of this as well because there will be a kind of coming home of jobs and investment um, 
that will that will occur because business wants to do it, that because technology enables it. That agr this agreement will ratify, but it'll also mean that the, it will look to many people like this is helping us out. And I think that that changes the dynamic. And the, my sort of last point is what the uncertainty has been doing, and, and I pay attention to Canada, the uncertainty throughout has, has led to less foreign direct investment in Canada. Uh, in the last year, Bank of Canada statistics are pretty clear. We've seen less interest internationally. Companies are saying, well, if we're going to invest, we might invest in the U.S. That's the only safe place that we know we'll still have U.S. market access, and that's the biggest market. Uh, lesser effect on Mexico, but a bigger effect on Canada. And then the second thing, which is even worse, is less inward investment by Canadian businesses, just in terms of their own, because they don't know whether they're going to have secure market access, whether they can afford to make that big plug. So that's hurt Canadian growth. And I think that means the debate is quite interesting. The U.S. has 3% eh, unemployment, reasonably, or no, it has 4% has unemployment and 3% growth. It's a good time. Workers aren't that unhappy. Wages are going up. But Canada and Mexico don't have that dynamic. And so I think, ironically, the uncertainty is working more against Canada, Mexico, and more against Canada than Mexico than in the U.S., where, where we seem to be riding the Trump uncertainty uh, engine very happily. Um, just to rather quickly, uh, I agree with Chris that uh, the, the six-year uh, time frame was, was engineered precisely that way to, to ride the political uh, cycles in both Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Um, I would like to uh, underline a few elements of, of the Mexican side. I'm not so sure that in Mexico the pro-NAFTA uh, consensus is that strong. Mm because um, the unions were never openly for it, and uh, many of the uh, social organizations that uh, have been involved with electing uh, López Obrador president, at one point or another, were members of the Red Mexicana de Acción Contra el Libre Comercio, so the Mexican network against uh, free trade. And so their position towards free trade is ambiguous at best. And I think what will happen is that uh, López Obrador has raised expectations enormously about what the, the leftist government will do and will have to do with the fact that uh, real possibilities are not that strong. So there will be a lot of uh, political play and uh, probably political, I do not expect a crisis, but at, le at least a lot of frustration on, on supporters of López Obrador vis-a-vis -vis his uh, trade policy. So that will possibly add to the uncertainty machine. And uh, I do think that we're in for a uh, relatively rough time, no matter what the, the labor statistics themselves are, because politically, it's, it's unstable. Um, thanks for asking that question, Jean. I think, uh, so there's, there's two bits of the uncertainty. There's sort of the immediate uncertainty around ratification, which uh, Canada's in a weak spot because it's very well known in the United States that we need the agreement. And so that puts us in a vulnerable position with respect to the lifting of the steel and aluminum tariffs and what that form is going to take. Um, and, and we also have the uncertainty of our own political calendar. So we have an election in October. And so the ratification timeline for Canada is very much something that's up in the air at the moment. Uh, should NAFTA, the new NAFTA, not be ratified before the election and should there be a change in governments, it suddenly puts a new government in a position of having to take a position on NAFTA. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it, so we have all that kind of small uncertainty around ratification. Um, but I think there's also some really big structural parts of, of U.S. trade policy as well as the new NAFTA that, that um, embed uncertainty and where it's my view that President Trump has weaponized uncertainty quite deliberately. And so, for instance, the elimination of the ISDS chapter, which I expect that is the state um, dispute settlement chapter, um, that I think will probably be discussed later today. There's lots of good public policy reasons for its elimination. The flip side of that, though, is that from a business perspective, it makes Canada a less attractive place to invest because Big investors aren't sure about the certainty of their investment. And so that's uncertainty. And then you've got the 10 plus six year timeline, which creates all of these future permanent opportunities to inject 
uncertainty in the deal. And then you have sort of US trade policy writ large. We're not really sure what he thinks about China. Uh, we're not really sure what he's going to do on tariffs. And so Canadian suppliers are busily trying to figure out what, what parts of my supply chain do I need to retool and revisit to ensure that I have guaranteed access to the United States, which is our most important market. And so there's all these little bits of uncertainty. And, and one of the things Chris raised is that if you have to make a decision as a business about whether or not you're thinking about expanding, your business is doing well, shall we expand more in Canada or will we set up a satellite in the United States so that we're there and then we're not exporting because we're in the States, um, maybe that's the better bet. And so it, it doesn't position well for growth within Canada. Um, so I think there's many, many, many little parts of uncertainty that have just become the permanent environment for Canada. And the number one thing that business wants is certainty. And they want to know, what's our corporate tax rate going to be? What are the rules around setting up this pipeline? This is, what, this is a big, big thing that business wants. And right now, Canada isn't able to offer a whole lot of certainty. Um, so my name is Christiana. I'm a recent political science graduate from the University of Alberta, and I do work here uh, in public service in Ottawa now. Uh, and my question is, um, I know we're currently we're talking about the uh, current political uh, context, but I'm constantly tying it back to civil society in my head, and I, I, you know, we're kind of making that distinction between there's like the business sector, the government, and then just civil society at large. And I'm wondering if you could provide a little bit of insight for for me. Uh, and us, I guess, uh, on um, whether you think that the three um, countries are approaching the engagement of civil society differently, and sort of in what ways they're doing that, and why do you why you think that is? And mostly, I'm thinking a lot about um, just kind of like the rise of you know social media technology and all that, and how, uh, especially for young people, I think nowadays we're so used to just you know if you don't know something, you have all the information in your pocket basically. Um, but what does that mean in the context of Canada, U.S., and Mexico, and are they dealing with it differently? So uh, maybe I'll start with Canada. So certainly, um, I I think uh, governments in Canada engage all parts of. You know, business, civil society. Sorry, what was the third group that you uh, had? You, government. yeah, um, uh, regions. Um, and you know, engage all these groups, and all governments do that. But I do think that different governments put different emphasis on those things. Um, and and I think that the current government is putting um, more emphasis on engaging with civil society than the previous government did. Um, but to the point I made earlier, I think it's important to look at what did the consultation look like and what are the final outcomes, where are they in the final outcomes of the deal? Um, I think Mexico, with the change of government, will probably have a different emphasis than it used to have. And similarly, in the US, um, the shift to a democratic controlled house means that um, labor groups and others will probably get more, um, uh, more attention. But So uh, thank you for your question. I think it, it's it's a very important question in, in terms of trying to look at what Mexican policy might look like. Um, you must remember that López Obrador was elected on a leftist platform, but um, he has a history of that. And so uh, civil society in, in, in López Obrador's coalition is, is the, the place of civil society is a bit ambiguous because um, traditional uh, organizations such as unions are not part of AMLO's coalition. They used to be uh, affiliated with the PRI, and most of the large unions remain close to the PRI in some way or another, so they, they're part of the opposition rather than in the government. And then you must remember that the López Obrador uh, political history as, as an opposition leader was mostly with the PRD, and that was the party that articulated uh, a lot of these uh, social organizations. But the PRD split and uh, gave rise to the, the Morena, the, the, the party with which uh, López Obrador was, was elected, but that brought with it uh, a split within uh, civil society organizations as well. So uh, it's, it's unclear. And then López Obrador, on top of everything, has a very vertical uh, style. So he's, he has been accused of being extremely authoritarian, of not consulting enough. And uh, 
we haven't seen a lot of, of it in action, but what we've seen, so uh, the first part is uh, the, the negotiation of the USMCA. We've seen that the, the side room that was established with NAFTA is still working as usual, so there has no, been no real enlargement of, of new groups in the side room. And then what we see, and this is a different issue that we haven't talked about here, but the, the, the negotiation about the National Guard and the creation of, of a, a national police that will be able to deal with, with uh, public security issues was uh, extensively debated in, in Congress, and it was only modified in, in, in response to civil society criticisms, not because the government's uh, bill responded to them, but actually because the opposition on, on the, both the right and the left took up these, these elements and forced them into, into the law. So what I see is, is that there is a discourse of in inclusion that is not necessarily there in the actual policies of the government. So um, the great thing about talking about the US and Canada is you probably already know everything, because you see it all the time. Um, the problem, in a way, for civil society in the US is agenda overload. Because civil society isn't just the unions, it's the religious groups, it's the uh, activists for a whole range of issues. And they all have high expectations of the Democrats. They all are raising a ton of money because Donald Trump is good for them raising money and it's getting people wanting to be active. I, it's a bit of a, a side story, but um, you know, these days you teach millennials because that they're the ones who are in school now. And one of the funny things about the 2016 election in the US was that it was the first election in which millennials could have been the majority of the electorate. They were certainly available to be that. Canada, that doesn't happen until the 2019 election, I think. And um, they didn't vote much in proportion with their numbers. And I, this is anecdotal. My, my impression, having talked to some of them, is that they, they were very conscious that their vote would help define them. And um, some millennials, anyway, are somewhat consumer-oriented. So they have an iPhone. That's part of their identity. So how they vote, they, they see that as, a, as sort of building a personal identity or brand and, and whatnot. It, it's, it's all very strange because I'm old. Um, and this is the problem with getting old, because I feel sorry uh, or sympathy for Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, because I think when men get to a certain age, the people around them always think they're authoritarian or becoming more authoritarian. They really just become curmudgeonly. But anyway, a curmudgeon is an authoritarian without power. So you know that's, uh, that's where we all are. Um, so anyway, the, but the dilemma, the that's dilemma. Professors. Yes, and professors too, yes. We have a little power. Um, so, so I think the problem for, for American millennials was that they didn't want to embrace Hillary Clinton. They were convinced by the polls that uh, Donald Trump was going to lose, so they thought it was a cost-free, you know, kind of abstention. 2018, you saw them vote because the voter totals went up and a lot more of them voted, and about two-thirds voted Democrat, about a third voted uh, Republican. So, you know, it's not a block, but it, it, it is interesting, and I think that's they're driving a lot of this because they're they're active in politics, but through causes, not parties. And they're trying to, to see where we go. And Donald Trump, in addition to catalyzing activism, is very good at dividing the opposition. And he he's courted the unions on his trade policy. Um, he's courted African Americans. He's courted various identity politics groups. With Richard Grinnell, who's his ambassador in Germany, he's leading a global campaign against discrimination against people on the basis of sexual orientation, which arguably has more momentum than the progressive approaches of the Canadians because it's the U.S. So you, you have these dynamics, and, and now a word of sympathy for Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is very good at her job. Don't expect our congressional leaders to be attractive. They're not. They're just disciplinarians who keep their caucus together. And she has been elected back to being speaker, but with a whole bunch of 20-somethings who are impatient and idealistic and want things now. And she's old school. And we vote this way because that's what gets us elected. And she's trying to discipline this caucus. And she's going to try, I think, with USMCA, not necessarily as the focal point, but as one of the many levers that she's got to figure out how big this battle is going to be and how much can I get from my constituents to get them to say, OK, fine, USMCA is, is all right. And at the same time, the activists are going to be saying, well, we can withhold consent if we don't get this. And they're gauging how much can we get out of this. 
and I don't know the answer. It's going to be very much a, a bargaining. And in the shadow of all of this, again, not only the 2020 election, but I would argue for the U.S., China. There's much more bipartisan support. And I, every time I come to Canada, if I visit other places, I, I feel like it's a different world because the U.S., the anti-China, it's almost like the Cold War, the, the, the real, it, it's, it's the tech people as well as the manufacturers as well as a lot of civil society that's concerned about human rights and other things. And that's so strong that I worry that, that, that what we're going to find is along the UMC, SMCA ratification road, Trump will say, if we don't have this, the Chinese are going to eat our lunch. And so it'll be a national security uh, patriotic thing to do to support it. And they'll try to use that to push this through, which will really minimize the influence of civil society if they don't get in early. So that's why I emphasize the bazaar or the bargaining that's going on now, because I think that in some ways that's, that's the last chance to get something in. And for some groups, trade just is I don't even think most progressives in the US really have a strong view of trade. Unlike the liberals of before, trade is a thing, but for a lot of millennials, the world's a smaller place. Globalization's a reality for better and for worse. They accept some of that. They just want to kind of bound it. And they may say, well, this moves in the right direction. So complicated. I didn't really give you an answer. But. No, that was great. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Lee, I have a, a question. Okay. I think. Sorry, can you come oh, sorry, sure. <coughs> I'm afraid I'm, afraid I'm a curmudgeon. <laughs> but um, from a business perspective, and as an investor, um, almost every conference call in every business, you want to know their contingency plans. So I think we just have to accept that the world is uncertain. Part of it's technology, part of it's politics. It's, so you want people to be agile. And although we have a trade agreement, if people can make rules or just change things or based on lobbyists and so on, the existing system doesn't seem to be providing certainty anyway. So I think, it, and, and people seem to be focused on goods and not services, which are becoming less and less relevant. So maybe the panelists could comment on that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I, I agree. And I think one of the interesting things, so one of the things that's interesting to me about politics for a while is I remember in the 90s, we talked a lot about the, um, the withering of the state that we were moving into a global world where transnational corporations and activist networks were going to be more influential in shaping reality for us. And the state was, was getting weaker. 9-11, the US response to 9-11 was an assertion that the state still matters and that you're with us or against us. And if your state has terrorists who are attacking the US, then your state is going to be held liable by the Americans and their allies. So it reasserted the state. And what's interesting now is that the debate about trade has come back to the state. The governments are going to make agreements that parameterize activities that are otherwise quite fluid and, and can, can be able. We've all focused on the state, and we think of governments now as being maybe powerful shapers of globalization in a way that in the Clinton days we would, we would have said, well, that's just a, you know, that, that's, that's vanity. It's a fig leaf. It's not going to last. So that's, that's the sort of first observation I would make, this, this re-centrality of the state. And the second thing I would say is that, um, I think we exaggerate how much the state controls these things and how much you can change the rules and then business is agile and adapts around the rules and still finds a way to make, make profits. You certainly see that in the European Union where they have a much more assertive sort of state structure and yet companies are very clever. They're figuring out what to do with Brexit. Everybody says, oh, they'll all leave Britain, but now some of them are structuring themselves. So business is, is, is quite good and I think the civil society is quite good and the state is not as strong as it looks. So that's my, my second observation. My third observation then is what brings us back to the state, at least in the, in the US context, and I think Canada has an echo of this, is the idea that the state fights for us, the people. So in a world of globalization, we need a tribe. This is our tribe, the nation, uh, and that's what we're going to rally around. That's why, in some ways, globalization's only had one sort of philosophy that's been successful at pushing it back, and that's nationalism. It's the one thing that's, it, it, at every cycle, hold people away from this you know, international soup, primordial soup of e economics. So in that sense, I think Donald Trump is underestimated as a very successful politician because he's convinced many people who don't like him personally that he is fighting for them. And that's changed the way that people viewed this agreement, even though they think, no, they don't want to give him a win, he's a crazy ego, all that. But, but he did seem to put America first. It, it seemed to have tangible meaning and even people like the people in the video that I know when I go home to, to Michigan, 
They genuinely believe that Trump cares. He's a billionaire, son of rich people, like why? Uh, he doesn't even, but he, they think he cares. And you, you get the same feeling when he's in uh, minority communities, when he talks, it, it works. Is Trudeau that successful? It is AMLO. And then it becomes sort of, so that, then it becomes the political game. I think we are gonna fight over what happens when the consequences of Trump's trade policy come home to roost. Inevitably, you start a trade war with China, it's going to start having effects in your economy. And I, I have a good friend who's um, married to a speechwriter for Nancy Pelosi. And so we, I've told this story before. She's a really nice lady, but we never talk politics when he's around, only when he leaves the room. And then we talk. And her big concern going into the 2018 election was that Democrats have really got a, a spokesperson problem. There's no great leader of the party because they're, they're not in power in the White House. And Trump's very good at it. And their fear was that the economy would slow down, unemployment would start creeping up, the uncertainty would start having economic impact, and Trump would blame the Democrats and say, you elect them to the House and see what happens. All of a sudden, the economy's downturned. Democrats are like the plague for the economy. You can't trust these people. Similarly in Canada, the economy slows down. People say, well, you could have done a better deal with Trump. You, you held out. You created this confusion. You didn't agree to his terms, and now we're not getting the growth or we're having negative effects. So this becomes a blame game. And I think Trump's well positioned in that. And I, I'm one of the people without any great love or joy about it who thinks he's probably going to get reelected at this rate. And that's going to change people's expectations of certainty going forward. One last comment to quote uh, the great o Osama bin Laden. I know I'll probably not get, re I'll get refused entry back to the US for even saying this. But you know, he once said that in one of his propaganda videos that, that people would see that his movement was the strong horse and the Americans were the weak horse. That understands something a lot about technology, people, or about political thinking. And Trump is the strong horse. He's winning, he's getting what he wants. And so I think there are some people who don't really care about politics, but who will say, Trump's my guy, he's fighting, and I'm gonna back that. And companies that will say, well, I don't know if Canada can protect me anymore against the Chinese in Huawei or against the Americans. So I'm just going to move more of my operation in the U.S. so I can make a claim to have the Americans defend me because I can't, I can't rely on Canada to protect me. And those uncertainties, I think, will be real problems. But anyway, that's very gloomy. Sorry, let me go. <laughs> okay, uh, just very quickly, I would say that uh, one thing that we've not talked a lot and maybe we should have is uh, talking about uh, investment in the context of both NAFTA and uh, USMCA because uh, that's a way, as uh, Meredith said, of uh, going around uncertainty. And uh, if I could show you the, the figures for investment, uh, Canadian investment in Mexico, you will see that they're actually higher than uh, trade in goods. And that shows us that uh, Canadians are finding a way to get that certainty by being on the ground. And then they're no longer investors, but actually uh, local producers. And that's, uh, that's a very important point, I think, even though uh, Chapter 11 is no longer I'd, I certainly take your point and, and would agree that, you know, uncertainties here get used to it, right? And, and if I think we could be at a conference talking about kind of digital futures and all kinds of talk about uncertainty would be happening. So there's, I, I think there's a, the world is headed for a lot more uncertainty in the, in the coming um, decades and trade policy is just one piece of it. Um, I would also say that I think that the conversation around trade negotiations consistently focuses on goods trade when 70% of our economy is focused on services and um, yet we spend a lot of time worrying about stuff moving back and forth across borders. Um, to that end, you know, we didn't even talk about the digital provisions today, but they, the digital chapter of USMCA will um, will tether Canada even further to uh, American governance frameworks around kind of internet governance, which are at odds with governance frameworks in the EU. And so, uh, you know, within services, there's parts of USMCA that um, are not uncontroversial that affect sort of the services end of things. Um, but I do think that, that 
there are parts of the uncertainty around NAFTA that don't certainly don't help the situation. I think the ability of business travelers to come and go, not being certain when you arrive at an airport to enter the US whether or not they're going to let you in and you start to get hassled more than you used to get hassled. These are all things that we know from um, our research on the long-term consequences of 9-11 have an impact on willingness to travel to the US, for instance. Um, and again, if you just move to the US, then you don't have to worry about being allowed in. You, can, you could just be there, right, and, and stay there. And, and so I think that we do have to be very aware of uncertainty, and I do would agree that, it, that the role of the state and the privileges and obligations that you have uh, from a nation state perspective actually really change a lot in a very uncertain environment. Your ability to move, all these kinds of um, the rules of, of engagement as they become increasingly sort of hooked to what your nationality is and what country you live in, um, then for countries like Canada that are very, very reliant on a gigantic big partner um, south of us, it, it keeps us in a pretty negative spot, I think. Yeah, and I would just say one thing is that yeah. I disagree that Donald Trump seems like he cares. <laughs> All right, fair <laughs> enough. I, I, but I, I want to I want to raise something, and it's funny because I think we we it's useful to think like the Americans for a minute. And w Donald Trump's critique of the negotiation of trade agreements by his predecessors, Republicans and Democrats, is that the U.S. opened but didn't get reciprocal opening, or didn't get enough reciprocal opening, and countries gave up a little with the U.S. opening, and there aren't that many things left. I mean, you point to dairy. But there aren't that many things Canada still restricts U.S. access to, and that's one of them, and it becomes outsized in Trump's rhetoric, but really, it's, it's not a huge deal. Most Americans sleep well at night not worrying about it. So, but but his, his attitude on, um, his attitude on economic, of economic nationalism has been one very similar to Richard Nixon, and I always like to bring up Richard Nixon. Uh, I don't know why, uh, because I remember him, but you know, if you remember the Nixon import surcharge in 1971 and the global political economy at the time, the U.S. had, under Bretton Woods, bankrolled Western countries um, and, and Japan regrowing after World War II. And how do we do it? Lend-lease at first, open trade, and um, the dollar as a reserve currency. The Germans, the French, the, uh, the Brits, less to, to a lesser extent the Canadians, Certainly, the Japanese kept their currencies low, so their products were cheap. So initially, they exported the U.S. to rebuild, but then they exported so much that they were crowding out U.S. manufacturing. And it was hurting the auto companies and so on. And that's why, you might remember 1968, Nixon threatens to leave the auto pack because he thinks you've taken unfair advantage. Because the U.S. is supporting the international security system, and we're fighting a war in Vietnam largely alone, and, and we ask for the allies to ease up and let their currencies appreciate, and none of them do. And so he decides to act unilaterally, and that sparks the crisis that leads to the 74 Trade Act, because Congress realizes they've given too much power to the president, and there's nothing they can do to stop him. Trump is in the same mode. And whereas you can have an economic discussion in a place like Canada, for the US, it's always mixed up with security. And the US thinks, look, we've been fighting this war on terrorism. We've been doing all these things. We're increasingly alone. Other countries are trying to take advantage of us in different ways. I'm going to reset the, the balance. And that means this is not fundamentally a negotiation about expanding liberalization. It's about conditioning the access you thought you already yeah. had and saying, well, you know, now you're going to have to do more in order to retain the same level of access you had. And what's interesting is in this debate, I, I certainly heard it um, here today, there was this hope that maybe renegotiating NAFTA would get us something new, mm -hmm. and then this disappointment that actually it seems kind of like a retreat from what we used to have, but that was always what Trump was about, mm -hmm. saying you're going to have to pay more and probably you're going to get less, and we can do it because we're the U.S. Arrogant, yes, but that's where we are. <laughs> um, I'm Sharon Janat. I'm a senior fellow at the Center on Governance at the University of Ottawa. And the one word I haven't heard today yet is culture. Um, as maybe some of the people in the room know, uh, Canada has maintained the so-called cultural exemption, which means that culture cannot be treated as same way, you know, in, as normal trade. However, several people have mentioned uh, the fact that. Uh, Trade and services is really a bigger factor here than you know shipping pianos across the border or books or whatever. Um, 
right now Canada is revisiting its telecommunications and broadcasting acts uh, to take into account what people have referred to as the digital revolution. And what I'm really interested in hearing from all three of you would be uh, what the relative attitudes of uh, business and civil society are to a potential opening up of uh, the digital environment to more cultural um, <laughs> exchange. Uh, just as a side note, I will mention, for those of you who are not cultural policy nerds like I am, is that Canada's traditional position has always been that we want to maintain the ability to tell Canadian stories to Canadians, and that you know uh, the domination of the US cultural industries has always been viewed as a threat. So I'd like to hear your perspective on whether that is still the case, and if so, who perceives it as a threat, the business community or the civil society community or both? I, I do know a little bit about this and the cultural carve out. One, one thing I would say is that um, the championing of the cultural carve out at the end of the negotiations, it's my, my feeling that this was probably more theater than substance and that uh, as far as I have heard, the elimination of the cultural exemption was not really anything any other NAFTA party was worried about. And so, again, if you think about um, Quebec, because the cultural carve out is very important to Quebec, and Quebec lost a bunch of things in this negotiation. They lost on generic pharma, they lost on dairy. And so if a government needs to put something in the window to say, hey, we fought for you and won, if you fight for a straw man that was never going to be um, knocked down, then perhaps um, the cultural exemption for Canada was never, uh, was never really something that was in doubt. Now, there are some legitimate questions around um, digital flows of cultural products because in TPP this is something that had been conceded in the original TPP and then in the CPTPP uh, where some provisions were suspended, that spe specific provision around the transmission of cultural products across borders was again removed by the Liberal government. And so it would appear that there um, potentially is uh, um, some implications for, for the digital environment. Now, the government has been asked very specifically, does NAFTA protect digital products under the cultural carve-out? And the government has very specifically said, yes, it does. Um, but I think we need to mm -hmm. wait until it's tested. Mm -hmm. so. um, just to... Uh say a little something. I did mention the film Roma in, the, in my talk, and I will come back to that. But uh, before, I would like to Do you mention... Get royalties for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. But uh, th th it is a story that's worth telling. Um, the history of, of the cultural exemptions uh, debate is, is interesting, and it's one of these other points where Mexico has left Canada alone, because Canada has this preoccupation that it needs to be able to tell Canadian stories to Canadians mm -hmm. that was never, has never been, and probably not going to be a Mexican preoccupation because of language, culture, and so on. So Mexico was never very involved in cultural exemptions and went along with it because it did something to protect its cultural industries, but it was essentially not an issue. So let the Canadians get it if, if they get it and how far they get it, fine. Uh, so coming back to Roma, it's interesting because uh, Roma was financed by Netflix. Mm -hmm. And uh, Netflix is a bad guy in Canadian culture uh, debate today. And it has to do with the fact that it's not telling Canadian stories to Canadians or to the rest of the world, whereas it is doing that for Mexico. So Roma is an example of how Netflix allows Mexico to tell Mexican stories, not only to Mexicans, but essentially to the rest of the world. So that is a, a completely different position. I can't speak much more about that because I, I'm not a specialist in, in cultural policies, but culture is one of these points where Canada and Mexico will, very, will find it very hard to agree. 
So, uh, you know, I'm from the U.S., so our culture is, uh, it's like we don't have an accent, we have a culture, we don't have a culture. Um, so just going back a little bit, um, I think what we saw in the 80s and 90s, the last time there was a big uh, Canada-U.S. stress over culture, was a, an important alliance between traditional culture and what I would call the entertainment industrial complex, the big companies, the Disneys and others, who objected to Canada restricting market access in Canada. It wasn't an objection to Canadians telling Canadian stories, it was, we don't want to be shut out of this market. And they pushed hard on U.S. trade uh, negotiators to gain, uh, for sure, market access. The compromise that was inherent in the Kennedy's Free Trade Agreement, and I know we talk about the cultural exemption, we really exempted it from the negotiations, but the piece that we came to in that, in that time period was that subsidy is fine, that's okay, but market access restrictions are, are not. And that largely held, and what happened after that was that you know the, the big companies who really drove this on the American agenda, the Disney's and 21st Century Foxes and all that, were satisfied. You know, CNN was available here, we are on cable. We, there just wasn't a real desire for change. And, and culture, if you think of it in terms of artists or whatever, they just didn't really care. So we were in the peace, we had a peace agreement. You did what you did, we were all fine. What's happened now, it's interesting, is that there is again an alliance of culture on the one hand, but now with big companies who aren't just Disney, now they're tech companies. The famous fang of Amazon and, and Netflix and Facebook and Google and, and others. And in that space, um, these new tech companies are pushing on the trade agenda for no data localization, for ways to, in which to not have barriers in access to information. Even Amazon chafing a little bit that they've been forced into this alliance with Canada Post and they would rather do their own deliveries and find ways around it and they have to go through these complicated warehousing uh, and software things to make sure that they, you get the Canadian edition of the latest novel by, you know, who knows, Tom Clancy or whoever. So in this environment, you know, they've, they, they've been making compromises and maybe Netflix will pick up a Roma deal of, uh, or Roma type films in Canada, but they're also, you know, not very happy with being, with, not, it's not just that they're not restricted in the U.S., but they don't, they, they want actually even more. And at the same time, what's happening in the U.S. is a kind of anti-tech push from the cultural people. So again, we're not an alliance. And it comes from two sources. One is a kind of anti-corporate culture, like people who, who love local. And they're saying, you know, uh, this is crazy. These guys are wiping out our retailers. They're wiping out our small town communities, our stores. So we want um, antitrust action against Googles and all of that. And it's about privacy and it's about personality. And it's been made worse by the fact that many of these companies are so-called deplatforming people who have certain political views. Now they tend to be people on the right. And so the right and a different segment of culture, not necessarily artists who exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, but maybe now religious groups, um, family values groups, anti-abortion groups are saying, we're, we're being threatened by these tech companies and we want cultural protection and defense from the government. So I think we're in a very interesting period where there was this one magical moment when there was an alignment and the US got what it wants. And now the US alignment is fragmenting. There's much more pressure against against those groups. So if Canada wished to push back, it would find the U.S. not defending its tech companies, but perhaps piling on. So it's a really interesting moment if you want to fight that fight, but you may not. <laughs> anyway, sorry. It's not up to me, sorry. <laughs> ben Novak, I'm a member of the public. Um, <clears throat> earlier, our invitee from the U.S., nope. you used the phrase coming home. Some industries or labor is coming home. Um, how does that correlate with increased costs? Uh, because they, they left, let's say, right. at one point to go to the low wage countries. Uh, coming home to a $15 an hour economy, does that affect cost of articles produced? And I have a follow up oh, question. Sure, go ahead. go ahead. Well, it's completely unrelated. Um, the interim between approval of the new NAFTA and the existing NAFTA. The existing NAFTA is in force. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Well, 
so that that's good. Um, so companies are coming back, but they're not necessarily coming back to what they used. They're not coming back to the same old norm. They're coming back to a world in which they have continued to substitute capital for labor. We have we have plenty of capital, so machines are taking over more and more jobs. They'll come home and they'll locate in places that give them the political protection that they want and they're happy to do that because they can now afford to operate in the U.S. because a machine doesn't have retirement costs, doesn't have benefits costs, and so forth. That's been tolerable because of the service economy that everyone has been talking about as people find ways that humans work better than robots. Um, and things like outsourcing call centers have, have not been public relations successes for many companies, so you're seeing some of that coming back. Um, in the best case, well-educated um, North American workers are able to move up a value chain and we commoditize basic labor, unskilled labor, because it's just a commodity. We just hire a machine to do it. It's, machines are fungible. There's a kind of sense that it's, it's really low value now, and so that's why we pay less for it. And so our, our young people go into jobs that pay better because they require more human skills, maybe more customer service, maybe more ingenuity. I have a friend who's a surgeon and he um, increasingly describes his job as, um, you know, kind of babysitting the machines because surgery no longer requires a steady hand. It requires that you know how to maneuver the equipment to send the little gizmo or the laser beam inside somebody's body and it's non-invasive and it's highly expensive, but, but that's the process. So maybe in the best world we all move up the value chain. We all become more intellectual workers. That will require in the U.S. a huge change in our education system, which is pretty spotty. Um, Canada's a bit better, but you know, there's, so there are definitely things we'll have to do. They're coming home for sure, and they're coming home because of taxes and other things, but I agree with you. They're not coming home the way they used to be. It's not a return to the way it was, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I might just add to that. Um, I, I totally uh, agree with Chris, and I think that this is where the trade technology combination is really shifting what the future looks like to the point around uncertainty. And I, I give a little lecture where I talk about to my students about the 3D printed shoe and how you all of the you know raw materials are there in a, I don't know, they're in tubes or something in the sky. I should probably get a tour sometime so I can speak more authoritatively about it. But 3D printed shoe, all the materials come. The thing is printed in a printer, and et voila, there you have your printed shoe. It hasn't gone overseas. Um, it wasn't made overseas. All the various parts that are required, all the components, once they're in the location, then, then it's all just assembled there, and it's assembled by a machine. And insofar as you need people, um, they're doing high-skilled work of fixing the machine when it breaks and that kind of thing. And and or they're d doing the design end of things. And, and so needing fewer employees with higher skills is going to be a big shift. I do think it actually places countries like Canada at a, a comparative advantage. But in a way, you may actually start to see less trade in the future. You know, if, if we don't need to send things on slow boats from China, then, then you can, and, and if we are in this more uncertain world with various countries fighting with one another and U.S. presidents acting in a certain manner and other countries being very authoritarian, then certainty is coming home and being there and making the thing there. And there's no question that that will be more expensive. My name is Derek McGrath. I'm a retired person. Uh, I found it very interesting looking at Ohio. And uh, I guess I'd like a comment of how we're going to bring the jobs back. And I'll just give a little anecdote. Uh, two years ago, I took the Trans-Mongolian Railroad from China to St. Petersburg. And going through Siberia, virtually every town had quite obviously excellent transportation facilities because the railroad was right there. There were beautiful new factories which were all shuttered. Probably 15, 20, 25 towns across Siberia. You know, I looked at that and say, are the people going to come back to Ohio and reopen those factories? And what will the USMCA, will it do anything for that? Or is it just Mr. Trump being a bullshitter as he is? Thank you. It's my view that the jobs aren't coming back to Ohio. Um, 
economic analysis would say that overall NAFTA has created more jobs than it has lost, but those impacts have not been even across the country. And so the jobs that have been created have largely been on the coasts, um, and it's on the coasts where people were pretty happy with the original NAFTA, um, and in high-skilled areas, and that those who were most um, disadvantaged uh, because trade does create winners and losers, those who are most disadvantaged were those with high school educations and um, located in the interior parts of, of the US. Um, and, and so th I, I'm confident that there will be new jobs in Ohio, but will it be a, a low-skilled manufacturing job? Not necessarily. Um, will it be something else? I hope so. I mean, there's no reason the people of Ohio um, um, can't work on those things, but I think the nature of the jobs will be different. Well, we um, the same thing in Ontario. Yeah, in fact, sure, yeah. sure. Um, and, th and then separately, there are sort of these big globalization effects around technology that also have, have sort of separate impacts. But um, uh, it, it's my view that many of the things that were negotiated around rule of origin and all of that are not necessarily going to um, make the U.S. automotive sector more competitive. Uh, than it was before. So I'll, I'll jump in on that. I, um, it, it, you don't mind? OK. Um, so Donald Trump is many things, but I think he, he is a man of his era, and he, he, he's really thinking about bringing back jobs the way they used to be. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have a great sense of how technology is changing the world. I think his agreement is, is regressive in sense of its vision of the economy. U.S. trade policy, and it's a bit political economy, I guess, but um, U.S. trade policy has really reflected the systems of production that we've had. And when we were part of the British Empire uh, before the revolution, we had a mercantile economy in which the U.S. produced a lot of raw materials and some substitutes for British imports. And after the revolution, we adopted a, a policy for internal economic development that is we call it the American system, but it was a high tariff wall uh, to discourage imports. The money raised from those tariffs was used to open up the West, build infrastructure, and uh, create a larger internal market. And that allowed us to have economic growth. That is, in a way, import substitution industrialization. The US made a turning in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, where all of a sudden we realized that mass production lowered unit cost. It was the scale economy. And that breakthrough meant that we needed export markets because the more and more markets we could sell in, the more units we could produce, the cheaper the unit was, that would allow us to maintain better wages. And that was sort of Henry Ford's idea. And the US became the avatar of opening markets and going against col colonial markets or imperial systems that had imperial trade preferences, as Canada used to participate in. And so that was our big challenge. That's what we wanted. Now we've come to this different place where we, we feel like, well, yes, we can produce things en masse cheaply. And under um, sort of Bill Clinton with the Seattle round, but more importantly under George W. Bush with the, um, with the Doha round, the US tried to shift trade policy to offer closed markets in developing countries a way to participate. Export-led growth. It's what we used. I could go on, but I won't. Uh, it's what we use to help rebuild Europe. The idea that you can export to us, get richer, and therefore, and we want you to open up your market to us. And many developing countries felt that Doha was a failure because it didn't really open up the US market enough. It didn't open up Europe's market enough, and so on. And they're the discontents of the system. And because the WTO relies on consensus, they've resisted other changes. So we're in this sort of jam. And Trump's like, OK, let's build up the wall. We have one great thing in the United States, which is a relatively robust consumer market. And if we can privilege our own guys against all these imports, we can get this economic growth. It's short term, but we can create it. So, so he, it's, it's a negative, it's a backward looking hope, and I think it's gonna raise expectations that we can go back to the good old days, which I agree with Meredith, we cannot. So then where do we go? Well, I think we have, we have two challenges. The first is I think one area in which both Canada and the US could make advances um, is improvement in public sector productivity. That is extremely unpopular with public sector unions, <laughs> but having, getting no change in your quality of governance, maybe even an improvement, by automating more of it. Um, give you an example. There, there's a software that the Transportation Security Administration, not everybody's favorite people at the airport, are using where AI um, assesses all the shapes in your bag. And it, it has a database including all the sub-assemblies of guns, bombs, et cetera. So they look for matches. And they can do it in, in a nanosecond as your bag goes through. Um, it's not. It, they just know how to look for what might be a disassembled weapon that you might be trying to bring into the US. 
that's going to eliminate a lot of TSA jobs. Not the highest paid, not the most popular people. Think about taxes where AI does a deep dive in the data that's available on you, not only your income but your spending, and tries to decide what your tax rate should be. Uh, and it's, it's all done much more efficiently than the IRS. Audits take seconds. Um, I, American terms, I know. Public sector productivity, if you look at where growth has been not only in the labor movement but in jobs, it's been in government and social services and other provision. And I think those are going to be under tremendous pressure going forward. Now, why I think that will be particularly bad is I think at least in the U.S., because we're such, uh, we love capitalism, it's great, um, is the U.S. is advancing a, a liberal, and I mean that in the British sense, agenda while at the same time not doing much to support the losers. This was the mistake of NAFTA and Canada's free trade, but at least on the American side. It's the mistake we're making now. What do I mean? One of the big causes in the U.S. is marijuana legalization. Most people will be fine with that, but there are a lot of people who have an addictive personality or who are in a position where they don't have a lot of social support, maybe their family is a bit messed up or whatnot. When those people um, abuse marijuana or it takes them off uh, you know, a track and they flunk out of high school or they don't, there's nothing for them. Now, we as a society know that when gambling addicts people, we have to, have, the casinos have to pay for a program to make sure that you can help people with addiction. Alcohol, same way. Even cigarettes. But with marijuana, it's like, hey, it's, it's, it's just going to be free for everybody. But the people on the bottom of the ladder, they're, they're the ones who are going to fall off the ladder. And what I see in the U.S., and I don't think it's there in Canada, but it worries me a lot in the U.S., is this attitude where the answer to all these problems is that we just throw people away. You know, they go to jail. We're never going to let them back in the economy because you're a felon. You're never going to get back in the economy. Nobody's going to hire you. Um, you. You played video games all day. Your grades aren't great. That's fine. You know, just maybe manual labor, mow lawns. I don't know. We don't have any use for you. It, it's a kind of middle class sort of you have to do all these things to go ahead. And if you don't, well, we don't care about you. And I find that soullessness is really going to be a problem now. I don't want to scare you, but I think Donald Trump understands that. And that's why, even though the conservatives aren't very happy, he's gotten together with Kanye West and uh, Kim Kardashian to talk about how do we get African Americans who are disproportionately in jail back into the workforce. So it's weird. With so many of these things, like you think, well, I think the right is here and the left is here. And so I'm, but, but I think a lot of our social policy debates are getting scrambled. And Trump may be the agent of it. I don't think he's the answer. But, but we should be paying attention to this as this goes forward, because we're really at risk of advancing freedom for the best off and the people ahead and leaving a lot of people behind. And that, socially, is going to lead to revolution or worse. And uh, we can't be sanguine about that, says me. Leon, do you want to um, Just quickly, because it, it's more anecdotal and it just uh, supports what, what has been said already. But if you look at what's going on in Mexico, and which is the, the place where the jobs were being sucked, to, to use Rose Perot's <laughs> words. Well, what you see is that deindustrialization there is also big, and uh, that uh, maquilas, which used to be the big assembling plants on the border, are uh, delocalizing themselves to either Central America or to uh, Southeast Asia, rarely to China, but still. So what you see is that the, these same plants that you saw in the video in Ohio that the ones you saw in, in Siberia are also there in Mexico sitting idle waiting for a miracle that most likely won't happen. And when you see what kind of, of industrial plants are booming in Mexico, then you see that they're extremely highly skilled places. So we're talking about the Bombardier Aer Aerospace plant in Querétaro, which is attracting a lot of people. But of course, it's not attracting those who were assembling, a, uh, you know, a, cell phones and, and the border, it's attracting engineers that are coming out from the university. So it's, it's the same story told again from a Mexican perspective. Yeah. Laura, did you, sorry, did you have a question? You said there was space. Yeah. We, we both asked a question. Well, you realize you are both just standing Lunch, <laughs> but I ask you last this is just a fast question, and it, it is for my, my name is Sergio, a PhD student here in the Department of Political Science. More for for Julian. Uh, you you mentioned Julian that, that the new the new agreement in a way was uh, endorsed by the new president of Mexico, even though it was signed by the previous one. I'm just wondering. I think we all know since the original 1994 agreement that Mexican peasants and small scale farmers were left. Uh, besides, that you can see in terms of migration how it went up over 100% in the next three years after the agreement, and 
with this new, new uh, NAFTA now, I think it's pretty much the same story being repeated again, taking into account that these were people, most of, mo most of these people were voters for, for AMLO. Do you think this is like a backstabbing of them? How can this, in a way, turn to the new government? Is, is it gonna be create a break let's say, between AMLO and this part of his political uh, force. Can I follow up on that? Okay. Very much related. Thank you, Sergio. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, also, Julian, you were talking about the tendency towards compartmentalizing uh, Mexican foreign policy. So up till now, AMLO made the decision, right or wrong, that he didn't want to fight about uh, NAFTA with uh, Donald Trump, that he had other domestic priorities, probably a wise decision. Um, but we have the whole issue of migration that, again, I guess uh, AMLO is trying to com compartmentalize to fight the U.S. on migration issues uh, while going along with trade issues, more or less. Um, so it's kind of a follow-up on Sergio's question, is that a viable proposition? Um, given that Trump is just not backing down on the wall. And Mexico's paying the cost because all those people who are coming through Mexico are now stuck in Mexico. They can't get to the United States. So Mexico is paying for the accommodation of those people and, and has to deal with the fallout, the political fallout. Thanks. Yes, uh, there's, there's two actual separate issues here because uh, the people stuck at the border now tend not to be Mexican, so they don't vote for AMLO, so that's a completely different political dynamic. And it's one that has started to turn a bit ugly because you've started to see in Tijuana, for example, uh, uh, emerging discourses anti-immigrants that uh, are similar to those you hear in Europe or in the US or in, in, in Canada. So uh, these people are here, they're eating up our, our public services, which were not very good to start with, and uh, we should just kick them out of here. So it, it, it is ugly, but it's not the same question as the previous one because they don't vote for AMLO. So they, it's actually the people in Tijuana with this uh, anti-immigrant discourse that, are, that might get the attention of the government. Uh, as for the people in, in the countryside that uh, voted for AMLO, I think AMLO has not forgotten them in, in the sense that uh, he has backstabbed them. He's just counting on other policies to uh, deliver his, his promises, and that would mostly be an increase in, in public service provision. and. In order to try to get out of the uh, fiscal reform conundrum, which has been going on in Mexico for generations now, I think you, you have to link that with the uh, closing all the fiscal loopholes, so the, the fight against uh, uh, gas uh, stealing and uh, uh, the fight against corruption in the electrical system, and all those ways to raise more state money without increasing the, the tax rate. And my belief is, is that AMLO is doing that in order to be able to fund new uh, public services. So um, I would invite uh, the panelists to make any last uh, comments before I call the panel to a close. Is there anything you would want to add? Or I'll, I'll just add one thing that I should have said about um, the question around jobs coming back. So, so the steel and aluminum tariff piece, um, uh, <coughs> I think it's the Wall Street Journal and others have shown the same analysis that that for every um, uh, steel job that Trump is saving by doing this, he's cost the country 16 other jobs, and and so this comes down to the sorting piece. If you if you want, you could save the the old jobs from the 70s and 80s and that that era that is sort of going anyway. You could save them. It will take a lot of resources, and it will cost you elsewhere in the economy. So. I will. I will add up on, on chapter eleven, the chapter that allowed investors to sue uh, governments in, in the NAFTA agreement uh, at an international arbitration uh, panel rather than local courts. It's been largely presented as a, as a loss, but actually from the Mexican perspective, it's uh, mostly perceived as a gain in, in that uh, Mexico was the victim, so to speak, of most of these uh, 
arbitration panels, and it lost most of these uh, things. So Mexico was actually not unhappy to have Canada on its side to get rid of, of this uh, particular form of uh, conflict resolution. It still is enforced between Mexico and the United States, but in a very limited form. So essentially, it's another way for, for the Mexican government to say we have protected Mexican sovereignty in a context where protecting sovereignty was actually not quite possible to do so. It's, it's mostly window dressing, but it's a way to tell the electorate that uh, the government has defended Mexican sovereignty and national interests. I'll just end with a, with a comment that maybe is the meta comment of all of this. Um, I think what we're really debating, and USMCA negotiations were an episode in a larger societal debate about who pays. And when we were negotiating the Canada's Free Trade Agreement, business said, you know, we want fewer tariffs because that's a tax on our business and we, we don't want to pay those prices. And then they also wanted low taxes and they also wanted less regulatory burden. And they, they lobbied, they convinced politicians to help them get those things. They pressed, didn't get everything they wanted, but they pressed. And what democracy is introducing is society saying, we gave you all those things, what did you give back? Because you're giving us less and less and less. We can't maintain social services because you guys don't pay your taxes. And you're moving jobs overseas, so we don't even have the job benefit that you created. So we're going to maybe take away some of your freedom, or we'll raise your taxes, or we'll find some other. But, but we, we have a society to maintain. That's, and voters are saying that they want that. And politicians being very, let's say something, they're very adaptable. Talk about uh, agile. Politicians can abandon a principle in a minute as they try to figure out how to get power. And they're trying to find ways to kind of respond to this debate about who pays and who, who pays voluntarily and who doesn't pay. Um, and I, I think that's a debate that neither the U.S. nor Canada nor anyone else has settled, but it's going to be the really interesting debate about the 21st century. USMCA will be seen as sort of a, an early discussion on those terms, but only the beginning. Okay, I would like to thank each of our panelists, Meredith, Julianne, and Chris, for a very stimulating conversation that opened uh, the uh, event. And I'm sure that some of these discussions will continue over lunch and over the other uh, panels, but uh, so please join me in thanking you.